Welcome everyone to this third installment of our construction arbitration series 2022. I am Rafael Carmona from the ICDR and as usual I want to just take a moment of your time to remind you that you can join us an ICDR YNI associate. Uh, you can go to our website if you google ICDR Young and International you will find us and in our website you'll find registration forms in English and in Spanish uh, together with the library of webinar programs that we have organized and recorded. We also have a LinkedIn group also called ICDR Young and International, so you can request to join and we'll be posting all of our updates there too. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, the co-sponsors for this event and this series in general, the ABA Forum on Construction Law, uh, the Society of Construction Law North America, and uh, Y Construction, Young International Construction uh, Practitioners. Uh, with the very brief introduction, I'll give the floor to our moderators for today, uh, Anya and Pasha. I also want to thank especially Anya, uh, who has been involved with the series and organizing this program. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours, Anya, Pasha. Thank you, thank you, Rafa. My, hi, everyone. My name is Pasha Anneli. I'm a member of the Board of Directors with Society of Construction Law and Associate Director here in Washington, D.C. with BRG. I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists and my co-moderator today to you guys. I'm going to start with Mr. Michael Black, who has been a construction disputes lawyer for over 40 years. An English barrister, he was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1995 and a deputy judge of the British English Construction and Technology Court in 1999, in which capacity he served for 14 years. He was recently appointed a judge of the Court of Appeal of the Dubai International Financial Center. He has acted as counsel throughout his career and as arbitrator for the last 30 years. He has pr practiced across the globe under most arbitration rules, principally in relation to onshore oil and gas, infrastructure, transport, and hospitality projects, but now mostly in the Middle East. Michael is visiting professor of construction law at the University of Manchester, England, and has taught at universities in the US and Asia. In his own words, he has seen most things that can go wrong in construction contracts. Next on my screen, we have Ms. Wendy Vinoit, who is a shareholder with Cozen O'Connor in Boston, Massachusetts. For over 25 years, Wendy has been construction lawyer, an arbitration advocate whose practice focuses on counseling contractors and owners on construction projects and litigating and arbitrating construction disputes. Wendy is an experienced trial and arbitration advocate with extensive first share experience in domestic and international construction disputes, including litigation in state and federal forums and mediation arbitration before the AAA, JAMS, LCIA, ICDR, and ICC. She also serves as an arbitrator and is a member of the panel of neutrals of the AAA construction, AAA mega projects, ICDR, CPR construction, insurance policy holder coverage, and Boston at large ADR panels, LCIA and ICC, and is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Wendy is a past chair of ABA Forum on Construction Law, a fellow of the American College of Construction Lawyers, board member of the CIR North America branch, and board counsel of the AAA. Next, we have Mr. Roberto Hernandez, who's joining us from Mexico City, Mexico. Roberto obtained his law degree and his master's degree in, from Universidad Panamericana, Mexico City. Complementary studies in Harvard, Cambridge, Davis, and Berkeley in negotiation, construction law, and US legal system. He's a partner director of COMET, a law firm specialized in infrastructure law, government contracts, and anti-corruption measures. He has over 30 years of experience as counselor and advisor of US and European construction companies in complex infrastructure projects in the fields of power, oil, gas, water, sewage, transportation, mega industrial projects, and mega buildings. Roberto has extensive international experience in infrastructure disputes as dispute board and arbitrator in Central and South America. He has over 15 years of serving as dispute board in around 30 projects of highway, roads, hospitals, schools, bridges, and airport. He's the only Mexican and first Latin American lawyer to be certified as dispute adjudicator 
by FIDIC. He is an arbitrator confirmed by the London Court of International Arbitration, and he's a panel member of ICDR AAA. Last but not least, my dear friend, Anil Markovic is a senior associate in the arbitration department of the Swiss law firm Bar and Care in Geneva. She acts as counsel, arbitrator, and arbitral secretary in our national commercial arbitrations concerning in particular constructions, oil and gas, sales, and post m and disputes. She is admitted to the California Bar and has training and pr practical experience in both common and civil law, as well as in the field of public international law, and she's a member of the Global Advisory Board of ICDR, Young and International. Very impressive panel we have here today, as you guys just heard me a few seconds ago. I would like to pass on the uh, microphone, if I say, virtually to Anya. Thank you so much, Pasha, um, and thank you for that introduction, that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to our speakers uh, today and for all of us that, and to all of us that are joining, to all of you that are joining us today. Um, so our topic today is multi-party proceedings in international construction arbitration. And um, due to the nature of construction projects and related disputes, multi-party arbitration is a topic that often comes up in practice. Um, if we take the typical contractual constellation between the employer owner and the main contractor, who will be parties to the main contract, and then between the main contractor and subcontractors, who will have their own separate contracts, but that depend upon and are interrelated with the main contract, it is clear that there can be many interested parties when a dispute arises. Um, and those interests will often depend upon the nature of the dispute itself. But um, when a dispute arises and an arbitration commences between either the owner and the main contractor or between the contractor and a subcontractor, the question is often asked whether uh, a, the third party can be joined in the proceedings. And if the parties to the dispute have agreed to arbitrate under institutional arbitration rules, these will most likely provide for um, the possibility of joining a third party. For example, the Art Article 8 of the ICDR's International Arbitration Rules, um, Article 7 of the ICC Rules, and Article 6 of the Swiss Rules, which I um, often work with, all provide for joinder of an additional party under certain circumstances. Um, and uh, I should mention also that the Swiss rules, that Article 6 of the Swiss rules, um, even provides for intervention of a third party into the proceedings. Um, but this being said, joinder of a third party also depends upon the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction, and in particular, whether the tribunal has jurisdiction over the party to be joined, either by express consent to the arbitration clause or through the extension of the arbitration clause um, to a non-signatory. This jurisdictional question will be determined by the applicable uh, Lex Arbitri, which may or may not have specific rules that apply to the question of whether a subcontractor, for example, um, can be deemed to have given implied consent to the arbitration clause of the main contract through its involvement in the performance of the works. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention that interestingly, this specific question of the extension of an arbitration clause in uh, the main contract to a subcontractor was the subject of a recent decision of the Swiss Federal Tribunal on an appeal from an award in an ICC arbitration in which the arbitral tribunal had found that it did have jurisdiction over the subcontractor in light of its involvement in the pre-contractual discussions between the contractor and the owner and the subcontractor's performance of the works. Um, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, however, overturned that award as it um, found that the subcontractor had not consented to the arbitration clause of the main contract as its involvement was typical of that of a subcontractor performing its obligations under a separate subcontract um, for their part of the works. Um, and I thought this would just be a, a sort of an interesting introduction to the topic for you all um, before we turn to our panelists, which we shall now do without further ado. Um, and as a first question to our panelists, um, because we'll, we'll, we'll organize our webinar today in sort of a question answer session, 
Um, as a first question, we'd like to hear from each of our panelists. Um, since I mentioned that Joinder is not just a question of the applicable arbitration rules, but also the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, um, which can vary depending on the place of arbitration. Um, my question to the panelists is, how is the question of joining non-signatories to an arbitration clause treated in the jurisdictions where you practice? And are there any specific rules applied in the context of construction disputes? Um, I will turn first to Wendy with that question. Sure, let's start with the United States. Uh, domestic arbitrations, uh, purely domestic, not involving any international parties, not involving New York uh, Convention issues, um, will generally be governed by state law principles. So it'll vary by state, um, and you need to really look at whatever jurisdiction you're in. Um, Conversely, when when you're under the New York Convention, when you have an international matter and the exercise of jurisdiction is pursuant to uh, Chapter Two of the Federal Arbitration Act, they'll generally apply the the choice of law rules of the forum, wherever that may be. Um, although some courts have looked to federal common law principles as well, um, you know we have that dichotomy here in the United States. I think most of you are probably um, uh, US practitioners, but uh, you know, I do wanna emphasize that. Um, the theories we usually see for joinder of non-signatories include estoppel, um, incorporation by reference, that is where um, an arbitration clause is somehow incorporated by reference into another agreement. Um, that often arises in the context, for example, of surety bonds, uh, bringing sureties into an arbitration proceeding um, under the, uh, the theory that the surety bond incorporates the underlying construction contract by reference, and therefore the arbitration clause likewise uh, applies to the surety. Um, another uh, theory is assignment, assumption, waiver, uh, sometimes agency, uh, third-party beneficiary. Theories come into play quite often. Um, and then, you know, veil piercing or, or alter ego theories where you have um, interrelated companies, et cetera. Um, and that sometimes comes into play as well where you have parent organizations. We often see uh, parties trying to join a parent. I actually had that issue come up recently in an, arbit in an international arbitration I had where one of the parties tried to join the parent company um, to the to the uh, ongoing arbitration. Um, so that that posed some interesting issues. Um, but as a as an initial matter, courts and arbitrators will always look at the scope of the arbitration clause itself to see whether it's broad or narrow. If the if the arbitration clause is extremely narrow and narrowly written, limited to disputes between the specific parties to that agreement, um, then it's going to be harder to bring in a non-signatory generally if it's an extremely narrow clause. Um, uh, I mentioned estoppel and waiver earlier. If a party, of course, um, is brought into an arbitration and doesn't object, participates, um, or brings counterclaims or cross-claims, et cetera, they probably waived their right to object later. Um, that's just kind of basic, but um, but that sometimes comes into play. Um, uh, I've seen guarantors of obligations. Um, sometimes uh, people will seek to bring them in if there's a parent company guarantee, for example. Um, see parent, you know, them trying to bring the parent in under the guarantee, and that and the success of doing that will often uh, depend on the scope of how the guarantee is written. You know, I mean, obviously the devil is always in the details, right? And uh, and you know, as a first matter, the courts and arbitrators will always look at at the scope of the agreement, how it's written, et cetera. Um, a final theory that I've seen uh, used is third party beneficiary, where you have an entity who tries to make a third party beneficiary claim under an existing contract, such as an architect or a design professional trying to um, uh, claim that third party beneficiary status under a prime contract agreement between an owner and a contractor. And when they do that, they're probably going to be bound by the arbitration clause in that primary agreement. Um, they don't get, you know, their, their cake and eat it too, so to speak, where they can claim third-party beneficiary status but not be bound by the ADR 
provisions of, of the agreement. So um, those are some examples of scenarios I see in the United States and, and when we see joinder of non-signatories in an arbitration. Thank you. Um, uh, and then, so turning to Michael uh, to hear if it's any similar or, or different in the jurisdictions where, where you practice. And oh, you're on mute still. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, absolutely classic. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, can I give uh, a health warning? I've only ever been a disputes lawyer, so it follows that every project that I've ever seen has been pathological uh, in some way. And I know that the statistics show that only a very small percentage of projects go wrong. So please treat what I say with a degree of caution. But um, So my current experience is primarily sitting as arbitrator in, in the Gulf states, uh, and of those mostly in Qatar, uh, Oman, and uh, United uh, Arab Emirates. Uh, as uh, you could imagine, the projects are often oil and gas related, but also general infrastructure with some hospitality, office and residential, quite a lot of airport work too. So most contracts involve an emanation of the state in some form. And traditionally, the Gulf government contracts have been based on the old FIDIC Red Book. Uh, this means that the arbitration provisions are usually ICC. Uh, and generally, the governing law is the law of the country of the project because the, uh, the owner or employer has the, the, the dominant position. Uh, in, in terms of negotiations being, as I say, usually an emanation of the government, but sometimes English law uh, as well, because often many of the consultants um, come from an English law background. But, but turning to the uh, ICC rules, as I think um, Anya has already mentioned, uh, Article 7 allows for joinder uh, before and after the constitution of the tribunal, but also Article 10 allows for consolidation where the parties have agreed to consolidation or all of the claims in the arbitration are made under the same arbitration agreement uh, or agreements or the claims in the arbitrations are not made under the same arbitration agreement, but the arbitrations are between the same parties and the disputes uh, arise in connection with the same legal relationship. Uh, this is all subject to uh, an overriding discretion on the part of the ITC court to allow that. Um, turning briefly then to the substantive law, the, the UAE arbitration law of 2018 is very modern um, in its outlook. And indeed by article 22, the arbitral tribunal may authorize the joint or, or intervention of a third party into the arbitration dispute whether upon request of a party or on request of the joining party, provided that he's a party to the same uh, arbitration uh, agreement. Uh, but if English law governs, for example, English law is quite hostile, for example, to the, uh, the doctrines that, uh, that Wendy talked about. There is specific English authority which says that the US um, the US doctrine of group of companies does not apply as a matter of English law. Uh, and that was found in relation to an arbitration where uh, that was argued. Um, if it's subject to local law, um, then Qatar, Oman, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia all have no such similar provisions to the UAE uh, and take quite a, an old fashioned line uh, when it comes to the joinder uh, of parties and will depend very much upon the arbitration rules again, as you said before, Anya. Interesting. So we already can see sort of a, a wide variety of approaches. And let's hear from Roberto how, uh, in your experience, you've seen this question be treated. Thank you, Anya. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will speak about the Mexican system. The Mexican system, differently than what Wendy has uh, explained in the US, um, is the arbitration regulations are in the commercial code, which is a federal law. Therefore, this applies everywhere in Mexico. The commercial code has a specific chapter in connection with arbitration regulations. And these regulations follow the on-citral arbitration model law. Um, according to the, our regulations, 
uh, there is no prohibition to join their third parties. And Mexico follows, in general, a very broad interpretation of whenever there is nothing prohibited for the, the person that applies the law. Therefore, uh, you can use it. Therefore, the conclusion is that there is no prohibition. If there is no regulation, there is no prohibition for joinder of, of, uh, in arbitration of third parties. Um, it should be said that uh, under these regulations, uh, they apply whenever there is no agreement between the parties for the arbitration. And this means institutional arbitration. Therefore, we could say that most of the arbitrations in Mexico follow the institutional path through different uh, arbitrations, uh, arbitration centers, uh, which follow, of course, uh, in one way or another, the joint depending on the evolution of the rules. So just in a nutshell, I could say that um, in Mexico, there is no regulation, but there is no restriction. And we follow usually the institutional rules that apply in the national and international um, arbitrations. So I will stop there. Thank you. Anita. Thank you. Yeah. So and and I guess in general, um, you know, the scope of the parties' agreement, in particular, the arbitration agreement, and then the the actual factual circumstances will will take. Uh, yeah, will have to be considered. Um, I'll turn to Pasha now for our next question. Yes. For this next question, I want to ask Wendy and Michael about your opinions as an arbitrator and advocate on the advantages and disadvantages of multi-party arbitrations in construction sector. Michael, specifically from you, from a uh, position of an arbitrator, what do you see as advantages and disadvantages of arbitration proceedings uh, in multi-parties? Thank you. Well, I think the principal advantage is pretty obvious, I think. Uh, one can resolve all the outstanding issues and one has access to all the relevant evidence in relation to a specific project. Uh, there's also no danger of inconsistent findings between, say, the owner and the general contractor and the general contractor and the subcontractor. Uh, of course, uh, if one's being cynical about it, um, such openness is not always in a party's best interests. And um, one thing I was taught very early on uh, in my career as an advocate, that justice uh, in an objective sense is not always what one's client wants. Or <laughs> he's seeking actually sometimes a rather unjust result. Um, but I, I think the disadvantages um, are, are pretty obvious too. Multi-party claims are time consuming, they're expensive, they're messy. Uh, often a party, particularly a subcontractor, doesn't have sufficient resources to join in a, a, large, uh, a, a large piece of litigation or arbitration with, with, as I said before, a government entity and maybe a very, very large general uh, contractor, particularly in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and so e an economically strong party can dominate the other parties in, in uh, a multi-party proceedings. Um, also, multi-parties make claims difficult to settle. Uh, there are commercial issues which will differ according to the place the party is in, in the structure and its long-term relationships. Uh, I'm sure Wendy actually has more hands-on experience of those matters than I do, so I'll stop there. I was actually going to return to Wendy from an advocate's perspective. Wendy, what are your thoughts yeah. on this? You know, and I, I have both perspectives as well, from, as, as Michael does. Um, but from an advocate's perspective, I mean, let's start with one kind of uh, preliminary statement that I don't see parties being joined to um, proceedings all that often in a traditional contract dispute. Um, as between owner, contractor, contractor, subcontractor. I don't see as many joinder issues in those cases as I do in construction defect cases. Um, it's the defect cases where you seem to have everybody being brought in, you know, every subcontractor, every design professional um, is being brought in because they're all pointing the finger at each other for the defect. Um, so I see, I tend to see more um, joinder issues in that context than I do in the traditional um, contract disputes over payments, et cetera. Um, and uh, so as an 
advocate, the, um, the advantages I see um, in joining parties is avoiding those inconsistent verdicts, inconsistent outcomes. Um, also, there, there can be efficiencies. When you have a whole team of, of contractors, for example, um, in the, you know, maybe subcontractors as well, all working together, um, you can realize efficiencies in case preparation, motion practice, et cetera. You know, somebody takes the lead and everybody else kind of follows along and piggybacks on, on their work. Uh, depositions, you split up uh, responsibility for who's going to depose whom. Um, and so there are efficiencies uh, associated with that, and there's more spreading of the work around. Um, disadvantages, however, is that these things can be anything but efficient. Um, if you've got um, parties that every single one of them wants to take their own discovery, every single one of them wants a, a, a bite at a witness, um, they all want their day in court, um, or you know, unfortunately, not to disparage construction defect lawyers, <laughs> um, but a lot of them, you know, they, it's a volume fee business for them. So they want to make all those motions. They want to take all those depositions, et cetera. So, um, you know, so I, I see it sometimes be highly inefficient, um, excessive motion practice, excessive discovery, um, sometimes lack of professionalism. The more lawyers you have in the room, the more apt you're going to encounter one or more who are less than um, uh, professional. Um, and that can make things exceedingly difficult um, and frustrating for everybody else. Um, harder to settle, as Michael said, uh, the more parties you have in the room, the harder it is. Sometimes you, if you're having a mediation, you have to have multiple mediators in order to marshal all those folks. Um, you know, somebody dealing with the design professionals, somebody dealing with the subcontractors, et cetera. Um, that, that can be really tough to settle. Um, um, and then, of course, get to the hearing, and you've got all these parties and all these disparate claims and allegations, et cetera. It can be very confusing um, uh, for, for both the advocates and the arbitrators to, to sort all that out. Um, so I, th I think those are all disadvantages um, to having everybody in the same proceeding. Now, I got to tell you, when you know, when I'm the advocate, I typically have the general contractor. And so if I'm in a dispute with the owner, I don't necessarily want my subcontractors who I'm also in dispute with in the same room. Um, you know, an international arbitration, it's probably confidential as well. And so I really, I, I want to be able to talk about both sides of my mouth to be perfectly candid, you know, and, uh, and sometimes take inconsistent positions as, you know, depending on who I'm fighting with that week. So as an advocate, it's not always great to have everybody in the same room, because um, you, you're dealing with, uh, you know, as again, as a general contractor, you're fighting with the owner and then you're saying something different maybe maybe uh to the subcontractors and trying to blame them for whatever's happening so um you know those those issues all come into play thank you um yeah thank you uh and i think so the next question that we have um the next issue we'd like to explore which i think is important uh certainly in construction disputes is, is the question of dispute board proceedings and in particular, when the main contract calls for um, pre-arbitral steps, such as a DAB decision, uh, whether there's a possibility to have additional parties, um, such as subcontractors, joined in that process, and where the subcontractor has not participated in that part process, um, would this act as a barrier for any reason to having that party joined in an eventual arbitration relating to that dispute? So. On that question, I uh, turn to Roberto. Thank you very much, Anya. Well, first for our young members, uh, it may be interesting to know what the, the, the dispute board is. So I'll be very brief. The dispute board is a dispute avoidance and resolution system that is included in some construction contracts, mainly FIDI contracts and other international contracts that allow the prevention and resolution of disputes during the performance of the work. So this is very interesting. So uh, when you have this um, dispute resolution, 
parties go to the dispute board during the performance of the project, they submit their claims, they respond, and there is a hearing, and there is a decision. So th this question goes to the moment where there is a claim and a response to that claim in connection with the dispute. And, and the answer is the dispute board is limited to the dispute board clause. And therefore, there are many occasions when the parties have the idea that they can only um, be themselves in this procedure. However, there is nothing that prohibits them to bring the parties and to request the party to agree on that and as to the dispute, uh, to the dispute board. Now, let's remember that the dispute board in some places may not have the same powers than an arbitration, arbitrator. Uh, they are in historical, but in within the contract clause. And therefore, there is a possibility. I have never seen, have been very many years in the dispute board. I have never seen a joinder of third parties. I have seen different contracts on different levels that have different dispute boards and are connected among them. But um, I know that, for example, there were some cases of PPPs in the United States where, where these kind of different levels. But usually, also in Latin America, where I have experience, on, on levels be, beyond, you don't have uh, dispute boards on the subcontracts. You only have from the main, um, the, the owner and the contractor. So uh, going straight forward to the question, there is no limitation if the parties allow it, if the dispute board allow it, but if there is no express consent, it is difficult for the dispute board under the civil uh, tradition in Latin America to invite and to consider that there are any other uh, parties to, to join there. This, uh, also, let's say that the dispute boards in Latin America are very young, and this has not been discussed. discussed. Now, to going to the second question, there is no limitation, Anya, when there is no joinder on uh, the other other participants in the project when you initiate an arbitration. So when if there is a dispute board process and this dispute board process doesn't call the subcontract or any other third parties, um, and then it goes to arbitration, there is no limitation or prohibition or anything that wouldn't allow any of the party or the parties or the trader to call the third parties to in order to join the process. So this is a very interesting matter, but I would say that we are still having in Latin America uh, a lot to learn on, on joinder because this is different from what our arbitration process is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Another question that comes up in multi-party proceedings is the various counterclaims and cross-claims that can be raised between different parties. Wendy, in your opinion, um, what are the conditions under which a joint party can raise counterclaims or cross claims? And how often do you see this occurring in practice? Do you have a particular example that a filing of a cross claim by a joint party raise questions um, of the tribunal's jurisdiction to hear those claims? Well, first, you know, if a party is allowed to be joined, it, it generally can avail itself of all procedures uh, available to a party in an arbitration proceeding. So, and and please, because typically if you're going to join somebody, you have to do it before the arbitrators are impaneled. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's very, it is much, much, much harder to bring somebody in after the arbitrators are impaneled. In fact, if you try to do that, chances are you're going to be unsuccessful in bringing in somebody new um, after all three arbitrators have been picked and confirmed. And that's because parties to an arbitration proceeding are supposed to have a say in who the arbitrators will be. Okay, so let's let's start there. So once once a party is joined, usually before the arbitration panel is, is fully nominated and, and confirmed, um, if they're brought in that early, they can assert any claims they want in that proceeding, uh, in subject to the arbitration rules that govern your proceeding, of course. Uh, but under like AAA, ICDR rules, et cetera, that most of us are familiar with, you'd be able to, as the joined party, be able to file any counterclaims, cross claims, et cetera. 
So, you know, say you're the subcontractor um, and you're brought in, you can certainly make claims directly against the general contractor. You may even have some claims directly against an owner. Um, uh, you might, you know, there's theories out there that might allow you to do that. Um, I have to say a big but, of course, is um, mechanics lien uh, claims that subcontractors often have um, on projects. They typically, because that's a creature of state law, generally they cannot bring those in an arbitration proceeding because um, any mechanics lien related claims have to be dealt with by um, the local court where the mechanics lien was filed. Um, that's a general rule here in the United States. Um, although uh, lien waivers can be dealt with by arbitrators. Um, I've actually seen uh, arbitrators uh, decide whether lien waivers are enforceable or not. And then that decision is then taken to the state court and used in the mechanics lien uh, proceeding. So that's just a, uh, an example of, of something I've seen in the past. Um, let's see, I was going to say, I see a lot of dispositive motion practice in, in joinder proceedings where, you know, you have all these parties, um, because, uh, everybody wants out, right? Uh, and, and so I see a lot more motions to dismiss early on, um, both as an advocate and as, and as an arbitrator. Um, I had one recently where literally there was, I don't know, 40 parties and, and 30 of them had filed motions to dismiss um, to get themselves out of there. And they had done that before filing any sort of uh, counterclaims or cross claims because they're trying to get out before they um, have a waiver or estoppel problem and can't get out. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, yes, I, when parties are joined and assuming they can't get out early, they're going to be filing claims against everybody they can conceivably be filing claims against. Um, and, and generally speaking, that will be allowed subject again to dispositive motion practice, um, down the road because, you know, most arbitrators do not want, um, really broad issues once they, if they can narrow the issues before they get to the hearings, they'll invite that. Um, and certainly I invite that as an arbitrator. I said, listen, you know, while dispositive motions generally um, are denied in arbitration, um, you know, there are definitely circumstances where they are appropriate. And, and if you can narrow the issues, uh, please do. Um, you know, it's hard enough. <laughs> That's um, that's interesting, Wendy, that you mentioned dispositive motions because uh, I was at a conference just this last Friday here between the Swiss Arbitration Association and the French Arbitration Association and and uh, one in-house counsel attending that um, that conference mentioned that she would you know like to see more dispositive motion uh, type of practice in international arbitration in in on the continent here because uh, it's it's a very foreign concept and uh, but you know, could in certain circumstances be appropriate. Um, right. So I think for our next question, it'd be interesting to hear from both Roberto and Michael, um, but I'll turn first to Roberto. Um, as there's been a, an increasing interest in collaborative contracting models in the construction industry. So um, do you see this as a possibly, uh, as possibly resulting in an increase in multi-party proceedings when disputes arise or, um, how is the question of dispute resolution being approached in, in that model from your experience? Thank you, dear Anya. First of all, I, I saw one comment from Mr. Ricardo Urdaneta about Latin America. I want to clarify. Maybe I, I want to say this is my experience in Latin America. I work in Latin America. I know that there is nothing historically. I don't want to get into that discussion, but thank you, Mr. Urdaneta. I was just to say that this is my experience in Latin America. So I don't want to mess with anybody in, in different countries. So with my respects to any country in Latin America. Uh, so what happens is that there is a lot of collaborative construction contracts that are becoming, um, for example, in Peru. In Peru has a very important um, development of NEC contracts, collaborative contracts, and there is an important interest from the um, Inter-American Development Bank to develop collaborative contracts. Why? Because they are looking um, for disputes to be avoided and solved previously rather than what I would say um, 
confrontative contracts. So in that case, um, there are the collaborative contracts means that parties work together in order to achieve a result uh, with different tools in the performance of the works and thanks to the contract and other dispute resolution mechanism, prevention and resolution mechanism. So I, yes, I see that as far as collaborative contracts may increase, they will have to include the parties that are parts of the contract, not only the subcontractors and suppliers and any others, but other parties that they, the, the, the original parties, employer and contractor usually um, need to solve the problems. So yes, I see and I hopefully see that parties instead of blaming each other and saying that there are third parties that are to be blamed, they work together. And this would be in that maybe in formal process that we we'll have to include for the benefit of faster uh, dispute resolution, uh, this kind of, of, of joinders and less formalistic than in, in the previous one. Of course, I think this is for the benefit on the industry and we hope that the industry understand that this is this would be a better solution. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Michael, maybe on the same topic, do you see the use of collaborative contracting and uh, multi-party arbitration being used um, at all or any potential for its use in, in the Middle East in particular? And and here I am referring to the continent and the Middle East, but uh, you know, without making any generalizations, um, Oh, we will. We'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we won't get involved in geography and whether you talk about the Near East or the Middle East or the Levant. We'll, uh, okay, <laughs> but this is where my uh, my my health warning comes in because, uh, frankly, when I see a project, the parties are far from collaborating with each other. They are, you know, at each other's throats, um, and. Um, it may be that collaborative contracts are working um, in the uh, the MENA region, if I can call it that. Um, but I won't see them because they're working so well that no disputes arise. But what I do see um, are really traditional sort of old school EPC contract um, disputes. Uh, and I think EPC contracts, old fashioned style EPC contracts are pretty much par for the course for the region in which uh, I practice. I have heard of the use of uh, NEC contracts and I've attended conferences where people are talking about the increased use of uh, DABs and expert determination. Um, I don't know whether people are just talking up those procedures or whether they're real world examples. What I do see is people going through the motions uh, of the um, you know preconditions to arbitration, the, the negotiation and the DABs and so on, just getting through them as quickly as possible so that they can get to the real sort of dog eat dog fights um, that that uh, that we do see a lot of. Because frankly, my experience again, such as it as it is through the lens of a dispute um, lawyer, it, is that employers pretty regularly, generally pull bonds. General contractors are completely unwilling to share any uh, information about their dealings with owners, uh, with subcontractors, and it is pretty much dog eat dog. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, I guess there's this hope uh, that more collaborative contracting will be used in, in the future. And then as Roberto said, it will be a question of dispute avoidance, we hope, rather than resolution, but I would assume that there will still be instances where, where disputes do arise, and, and I think some, some innovative uh, approaches to that might, might be interesting to see. Um, I've been teaching students th for that, that for 30 years. <laughs> All right. Well, my optimism is okay. now uh, <laughs> decreasing, but yeah. but um, no. So so I think uh, that that brings us towards our, our wrap up here, um, because we did want to give time to, to each of you to sort of uh, share with us your your key takeaways um, on the on the question of, of multi party proceedings, uh, the use of them in construction disputes, what you've seen, what maybe, you know, an anecdote uh, from your experience that that uh, is uh, illustrative, um, or just, you know, whatever you you would like to share. 
So um, for that, I would turn first to Wendy for some for some final thoughts. Yeah, um, I was I wanted to comment that I, you know I'm seeing in more and more construction contracts um, that there are express provisions allowing for joinder of parties. Um, a lot of prime agreements specifically now require um, that um, subcontractors, to the extent there are pass through claims, et cetera, can actually be brought in, and that the general contractor must flow that down to their subcontracts and uh, purchase orders. Um, and again, the idea being that there will be a ready mechanism for joinder, um, should that be desired um, by, by anyone involved. Typically, it'll be at the option of either the owner or the GC. Usually, subcontractors can't trigger that themselves. Um, but I am seeing more and more of those types of provisions showing up in agreements and again being flowed down so that um, subcontractors and suppliers and sometimes design professionals as well cannot avoid being joint um, because they've got an express agreement authorizing such joinder. Uh, because typically when you know you see a lot of resistance to people who are being joined because they don't want to be joined, right? So um, you see a lot of motions and, and other um, fighting. Sometimes they run to court to try to not be joined um, in an ongoing proceeding. So, um, uh, you know, I see ancillary proceedings, but it's, but it's always the resistance to being joined. I don't, I don't see anybody saying, gee, I really want to be joined in your arbitration proceeding. Um, you know, I, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so, um, you know, like I said earlier, uh, you know, if you're going to join somebody or going to attempt to join somebody, you need to do it early and typically before the arbitration panel has been selected. Um, because otherwise, there is a strong argument under um, both uh, the state arbitration acts as well as the federal arbitration act that. Um, once the, the tribunal's appointed and, and confirmed that you can't join people and, and because it's a due process issue. Um, and so, you know, it, it will be very difficult if somebody's resistant to being joined to get them in after the panel has been confirmed. Um, and even harder if you're a year into the proceeding, right? If there's already been discovery and the pleading practice, et cetera, um, it's going to be virtually impossible to join somebody new into, into that proceeding. Um, consolidation's a little different, um, and we won't, I don't think that's a topic for today's discussion, but joinder and consolidation often go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, because you have companion proceedings between um, parties to the same project, um, and and sometimes you see those proceedings. Uh, you know, somebody seeks to consolidate them for efficiency reasons, but um, that's kind of beyond the scope of today's uh, discussion. Um, and I was just going to say, as an arbitrator, um, you know, I don't invite having everybody into the same proceeding. Uh, I do think it starts to get somewhat unmanageable, particularly if, you know, if you have a general contractor and a subcontractor, maybe they have uh, issues between them that are not necessarily um, issues that the general contractor is then seeking to blame on the owner, right? They're not pass-through claims, for example. Um, that gets very difficult to manage in one proceeding if you've got kind of both um, both types of claims going on and they're not um, pass-through type claims to the owner or passed down claims from the owner. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't invite it. Um, and, and, and frankly, on traditional contract disputes, I don't see it that often. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of parties seeking to bring in uh, third parties uh, into arbitration proceedings. Okay, interesting. Um, and thank you for, for all those really great takeaways. Um, Michael, how about you? Your turn. Well, uh, uh, Wendy just ate my lunch, basically, because <laughs> I was going to say um, pretty much pretty much the same thing, uh, but in a slightly different way. Because uh, I'd I, I suggest that it's actually too late to contemplate whether or not you can join a third party or consolidate claims after a dispute arises at all, even prior to um, constitution of the tribunal. Uh, my advice generally 
would be to have to think about it at the drafting stage of, of uh, a construction contract or project documentation. Uh, and I would say you have to think about three things uh, in particular. Number one, express provision for joinder, uh, as, as uh, Wendy said. Uh, or, or secondly, uh, perhaps uh, in, in addition to that, uh, incorporation of institutional rules that allow for joinder and consolidation, like the ICC rules or uh, other, other rules. And thirdly, and in many ways, perhaps most importantly, what is permissible under the law of the arbitration agreement now now this is this is a this is another subject that's ripe for probably a series of seminars but I, I would just ask people to bear in mind that the law of the arbitration agreement may not be the same as the law of the seat or indeed the law governing the substantive contract although it is very often one or the other um, and so it, it's, it's quite a technical uh, uh, consideration when one is just looking at, at what law is likely to apply to the arbitration agreement and whether it will permit, um, in, in the absence of express wording, uh, the, the joinder of parties or, or the consolidation of, of linked arbitrations. That's my bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, certainly very important questions to be thought of at, at all stages of of a project um and and so roberto uh from your end what what should we be aware of and thinking of and keeping in mind after this webinar i think that the after these very interesting um discussions and conversations uh that's why we should emphasize on dispute avoidance <laughs> because in some way um we are getting more and more complicated for the industry it's not i mean uh, I love arbitration, don't take it be wrong. I am an arbitrator and I think this is the a wonderful um, goal for, for lawyers to understand and to know the disputes and everything. I think that is what we like and we love. However, for the industry, it is bleeding very much with all these disputes. And therefore dispute avoidance is, is a very relevant topic to discuss today. In some countries, as Michael says, there should, it could be a little bit more complicated, but I think there are more and more efforts in the collaborative contract with the dispute boards in order to diminish the uh, complexities of uh, arbitrations and other uh, further instances. And from the joinder, I think that party should um, apply what Wendy says that if, if we have to go, there is no dispute boards or other collaborative contracts, then we should uh, foresee to include all the tools in order to allow on the easiest way possible for the, all the parties that are involved in the, in the project to be part of an arbitration in order to avoid these kind of um, matters that could interrupt, disrupt, or don't allow um, an arbitration to be as smooth as possible. So that will be my takeaways. And thank you. It was be, having a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, I wonder, since we have six, five, six minutes left, there is a question from, from one of our audience members that might be interesting to discuss. Um, and uh, I'm going to let whoever, you know, which one of our panelists wants to maybe jump in on it. Um, so the question from Jonathan, and I don't see his full name, but Jonathan is any particular joinder considerations when the contracting party is a joint venture? Um, so I, I mean, I would think generally not because they would all be party to the same main contract, but I don't know if anybody has a particular experience, um, even where perhaps there were issues between joint venture members that then uh, created interests that were not aligned um, in an arbitration, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if anybody has, has thoughts on that. Jump right in. <laughs> I mean, we, we do get a lot of JV disputes um, in, 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 in my region, but they're usually between the co-venturers. Uh, when, when the JV is looking outwards to a, a supplier or, or, or a, a general contractor, if it's if if the JV is the employer, or if it's or or if it is the general contractor looking to to the employer, 
or, or owner, that they stand together, as you say, Anya, because they are, the JV is the party to, to the contract, um, whether it's an incorporated party or an unincorporated party, but it stand, but, but the members of the JV stand together and then fight behind the scenes <laughs> between each other, generally. Okay, good. Unless Wendy or Roberto have other things to add. Yeah, I was just going to say, usually um, when I see joint ventures, um, yes, the joint venture is the contracting party, but oftentimes the partners in the joint venture are also signatories to the contract. Um, and so as a result, they can be brought in. Um, and of course, you've got the issues of an incorporated joint venture versus an unincorporated joint venture. Um, so there are some complexities there, but, um, you know, I will often see um, JV partners brought in because they are direct signatories. Yeah. yeah. Anya, uh, uh, in addition, there are some contracts and uh, some operations that consider the joint and several liability of the, the parties, as, as Wendy says, the shareholders, other members, collateral. So I think this is something that necessarily takes the, um, the joinder because the, they, they have to be there because they will affect their interests sooner or later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we also had a question in the Q&A. Somebody asked about the construction industry rules of the AAA, um, specifically providing for joinder after the tribunal is constituted. I actually pulled them up just now because they don't specifically allow for that. They, they, they say you can make a request for joinder. They just, and they don't say when it's the time frame it's limited to. Um, it's just more of a procedural mechanism, the, the rule seven mechanism in the uh, construction rules. Um, and it's they have a rule seven arbitrator uh, provision as well to decide such issues. But when that process is invoked, you'll see all the Federal Arbitration Act uh, defenses to joinder. And that will include the fact that if a panel is already in place, that the, the party that you're seeking to uh, join may have a very good defense to joinder uh, on that basis. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up that question, which I didn't see um, in on my screen, but um, I think it's important to maybe end on the note that even if, you know, a, an institutional arbitration set of rules allow for joinder, that's not the, the end of the question, because um, there will be defenses, questions of jurisdiction, and, and, and all of that that will have to be considered as well. Mm -hmm. um, so on that note, um, I would like to just thank my co-moderator, Pasha Ameli, so much for organizing this uh, webinar with me. Um, I hope we do another one soon. Um, thank the ICDR Young and International and all of our co-sponsors uh, for this, for this particular session. Um, also mentioned that there's a fourth session coming up uh, in a few weeks, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, thank Wendy and Michael and Roberto for such great uh, comments and such a great discussion today on the topic. Thank so. you, you, and passion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you so much. All right. Have a nice afternoon, evening, day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>